A very buggy evening to everyone. Welcome to the daily wrap up and Q and A for Bama Bug Fest on the web for the Stings and Biting Things Day that took place today, Saturday, July sixteenth. We have been collecting all of your questions and comments about the event content during the day, and we'll be asking our panel of experts to help us answer as many as we can. These daily wrap ups happen every day of Bama Bug Fest on the web at seven p.m. Central Standard Time. I am Catherine Edge, director of the Warner Transportation Museum, happy committee member of the Bama Bug Fest uh, planning committee, and your moderator for this week's Q&A sessions. We're joined this evening by Dr. John Friel, director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History, Ali Sorley, education outreach coordinator with the Alabama Museum of Natural History, and Justin Snipes of the Comic Strip, your one-stop location for comic books and comic book merchandise. Uh, you might recognize them from the programs we've had throughout the day. And they've been kind enough to agree to come back this evening for a quick Q&A session. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for helping us with the event today. So, uh, John, I'll just ask you quickly, how did everything go? I think it went really well. Um, I watched, I got to see Allie do her song and dance this morning. And then we, it was a great interview with Black Widow and Dr. Echeverry. I had my segment about kind of common uh, bugs you might find in your backyard that bite and sting and the wrap up. So everything's gone as planned. Uh, I don't think there were any, anything more than the usual technical difficulties. That's always a lack of technical difficulties is always, always a good thing. Um, Ali, Justin, you want to weigh in on how, uh, how the overall day went? Yeah, I had a good time. It was fun. Yeah. I was I mean, only able to be there for like 30 minutes, but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it went well for me. I thought it was great. Um, I really liked listening to um, Justin and, and Dr. Echeverry and Black Widow on theirs. And then Dr. Friel, as always, did a great presentation. I had to learn a lot from him. So it was fun. Let's, let's not forget our colleague, Rebecca. I mean, she really is the oh, glue. Oh, for that, sure. And uh, she did a great job as well. Yeah. Rebecca's, Rebecca's the one that makes all of this happen, everybody. <laughs> We, we we love Rebecca and would flounder without her. Let's uh, let's be perfectly honest. Um, well, thank you all so much for that update, and uh, we can jump into some comments and questions. If you're just uh, if you're just tuning in with us and have some questions that you've thought of since the segment that you enjoyed, please feel free to ask us in the comments. And um, even if it's for one of the guests that we had during the day who are not part of the Q&A session, ask anyway, because we can absolutely make sure that your questions and comments reach that person. So don't be shy and um, feel, free to, feel free to comment uh, with any of your questions um, from any of the segments. Uh, so let's start with, um, with some uh, Further details of the, the 10 a.m. song and craft. So, Allie, this is going to be uh, directed primarily at you. Um, you and uh, Lance Simpson, who is our colleague at uh, Rogers Library, teamed up for this one. So um, how did how did that go? Yeah, it was great. Um, you get to see Lance play guitar, which is wonderful. It's always something that I love to do. He's very, very talented. Um, he has been, I don't know how long he's been playing, but he's great at it and so he was kind enough to agree to learn that song and um yeah we went to his garage as you can probably all see in the video um and stayed social distanced and you know made sure that we were doing it all safely and uh just had a good time it was fun yeah. it was also really hot outside but it was fun <laughs> yeah so it's um Anybody remember the uh, a number a number number of years ago now? Richard Simmons did a um, video series called "Sweating to the Oldies." You guys were sweating to the insects. We were sweating to the insects. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you can't help it in July in Alabama. You just can't help it. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about the song that um, that you and you and Lance played. Is that a song that you've used before, or was this a purely original piece? Yeah, so this is a new one for me. Um, I happen to be a collector of songs uh, to try to use for programming that we have at the museum. Um, but I have not seen this one before. So I was doing some research for this event and um, came across a teacher website that had this song on it. And it was just everything it needed to be. It was perfect. It was exactly what we needed for the event. So um, I uh, immediately sent all the details to Lance and we kind of got it all figured out. Um, 
which I was excited about. I'd, I've never heard, um, I've heard a lot of other songs put to that tune for kids, but I had never heard this one that had so many wonderful like insect stuff involved. So um, I'm glad we found it. I think it, like I said, I think it was a perfect fit. Fantastic. And um, what, uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the craft that, uh, that was part of that, that 10 a.m. segment. Yeah, that craft was great. So um, if you guys haven't seen it yet, you should go back and look, but it's a, it's a buzzing craft. It makes this great buzzing noise. And um, we, I was able, well, so the craft I found online um, and the craft was initially just, you know, like a piece of, a piece of paper and there are other things, but I found that it would be incredibly easy for us to adapt it to this event and turn it into some sort of buzzy insect. Um, and so we, I think the one that I showed in the video, I think was how to turn it into a bumblebee, but I've made ones that look like cicadas. I've made ones that look like flies. I have one that looks like a wasp butt, um, lots of different butts, lots of different insect butts. Um, and uh, I think it's great because you can, it's, it's, a, it's a craft that you can use to research. Uh, so it's like if you're at home and you're trying to find some, you know, you're learning more about insects and you can have a little lesson with your kiddos about um, those like buzzing insects and you can look up pictures online and you can have them use those to inspire the, you know, the coloring portion of that craft. Um, that buzzing sound is a great one that uh, you can kind of just adapt to fit any of the insects that make a sound that is similar to it. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, thank. Thank you for the. Thank you for all the additional information and knowing that um, that you were able to turn um, like utilize the exact same craft and manipulate it just a few ways to do um, create several insects. That's um, that's a, that's handy dandy for anybody anybody wanting to wanting to do it. It's not a one insect kind of uh, kind of craft. So that that makes it very user friendly. That's awesome. Yes. Hopefully, I hope everyone got to to use it a lot. Well, again, if you missed um, if you missed any of the segments today, you can catch all of it on all of our social uh, social media websites and our YouTube channel. Everything is uh, archived there, so everybody make sure to go and check it out. Even if um, you weren't able to tune in at the time, um, we have everything archived just for your viewing pleasure whenever you are able to do it. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, we've got a couple of comments now about um, that are pertaining to Black Widow. So, uh, Justin, this may be your your time in the limelight, um, and uh, John as well. So um, apparently there are there are several Black Widows. So how did the one we are familiar with get to be known as Black Widow? Uh, well, she was the first major one. There was a Golden Age one that I mentioned in the first talk that was completely unrelated. She was a psychic. Her real name was Claire Voyant. That was her real first and last name. It hurts me to say that every time. Uh, I love that. <laughs> she was Black Widow before Marvel Comics was even Marvel Comics. They were known as Timely Comics at that point. Uh, so then they just recycled the name, which they did several times. There's a Golden Age version of a character called The Punisher that was completely different from The Punisher. Uh, a Golden Age Human Torch, who's actually still around with the other Human Torch, but he's a robot. Golden Age was weird. It was the 40s. <laughs> so, so they reintroduced the name Black Widow with the character that debuted in Tales of Suspense as an Iron Man villain. And that's still the one we've got now. It's just they expanded her origin to be from the Red Room program, which is the Soviet-Russian uh, spy program. And so there were several other graduates from that program who all wanted to call themselves Black Widow also including one that's going to be in the new movie coming up. Her name is Yelena Belladz something or other. <laughs> something Russian. It's Yelena. That's, that's, she's the blonde one, the blonde <laughs> widow. That's all, but she was Black Widow for a little while, and then she died, but she's back. That happens Aren't in you? comics a lot. I think, of, I think I've seen that. I think I've seen the trailer. Aren't she, are she and Natasha related? No, they're just from the same program. They're not. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, for some reason, I thought they were related. I only saw the trailer once, so um, I haven't exactly committed the details to memory. But, yeah, they uh, they, they might have altered it in the about. movie. Yeah, it might be that she's related in the movie, but uh, that hasn't been confirmed or denied yet. But in the comics, no. In the comics? That one's probably going to be the future Black Widow for all the, the Marvel movies since Scarlett Johansson's version is 
very, very dead. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I, I really, I have to say, I really like Scarlett, uh, Scarlett Johansson's portrayal of uh, Black Widow, and um, unless there's some comic book magic that you uh, just that you just referred to that could uh, could make her, you know, make her come, make her magically and miraculously come back, I, I'm, I'm doubtful. But that does make me a little bit sad because I like the way that she, I like the way that she plays the character. Um, sure. But um, so John, a little bit more. Um, entomologically specific, there, um, there are black widow spiders that, um, black widow spiders come from one of two groups that are dangerous to humans. Um, the others um, are brown recluses. Um, so actually, I guess this is a question for Justin. I'm sorry, I misread my notes. Is, um, so we have black widow as a, as a comic book character and that is based on the spider. Is there a brown recluse comic, uh, based comic book character? If there is, it's so obscure that I don't know about it. <laughs> and that, then they probably don't exist. I have a feeling like there should be. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't yeah, know no. about it, I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, because the you know the, that's the thing about Black Widow, the the character though, is that they took the name more from the stereotype of uh, you know, deadly femme fatale than they did mm -hmm. anything really spider related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But maybe uh, yeah. they'll be inspired after our two o'clock talk that you were a part of, and they'll say, "Ah." Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, now we need I'm, a brown recluse. <laughs> I'm sure Kevin Feige is just sitting here with bated breath watching to see what all of us say. <laughs> he is, I mean, you guys wrote a whole Black Widow storyline in the two o'clock one too, so I agree. I think they're just waiting. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, I think the brown I think I think someone known as the brown recluse definitely needs to be created and but I can't decide I can't decide if I want the brown recluse to also be a female character or the brown recluse to be a male character. So we've got a female <laughs> but we've already got Spider Man. So, I don't know. I'll leave that up to somebody else who knows a lot more about it. We, we can leave uh, it ambiguous. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very relevant. Good, good point, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, the the um, and I, I believe Dr. Um, Echeverry uh, mentioned this is um, in, in one of his segments. Um, maybe not today, but I think he mentioned it earlier this week that black widow sp spiders often don't bite unless provoked. And it could be said the same for the Black Widow or uh, Natasha that she won't attack unless provoked. Uh, Justin, is that is that an accurate description of her character, um, similar to the Spider? In the movies, yes, but in the movies they gave her so much more personality than she's ever really shown in the books. In the comics, since you know, the fifties, she's been just the stereotypical uh, cold. Uh, unfeeling angry russian super spy she mm -hmm. she has very little characterization over the past 70 years uh, in fact the the very idea before the avengers movie came out that she was going to be the sole female on the team was laughable <laughs> because she was so unheard of she'd never really done anything of note she just she was the perennial guest star mm -hmm. but all the other ones that they could have used like she hulk that was tied up with movie rights. Uh, Scarlet Witch was tied up with the mutant stuff. Captain Marvel hadn't, they just didn't really have any other choice. Mm -hmm. But, but Scarlet know, Witch and Captain Marvel have since been mm -hmm. able to turn, um, their own stories have either been told or incorporated as the, as the franchise, I guess, has, has grown. So, right. so that probably mm -hmm. was actually a good thing. You know, Black Widow has become a more, um, more well-known character, but then those other characters have had a chance to have, um, you know, have their, their time, their time as well. So oh, for sure. Yeah. Everybody in the Avengers movie would have counted as C-list heroes, except for the Hulk before that. Like the, if you had told anyone from 1995 that Iron Man would become one of the most popular characters in the world, they would have thought you were drunk or high because it just <laughs> wasn't going to happen. He was known for being an alcoholic and kind of a jerk, but he wasn't a leader. He was just he had his own book and he never showed up in anything else except yeah. maybe the Avengers. But because Marvel had to sell the rights to Spider-Man and the X-Men and the Fantastic Four when they went bankrupt they had to use those B and C list characters. 
Also, Work Robert Downey well. Jr. came around and he did a great job. <laughs> yeah, he pretty much is Tony Stark. Yeah. <laughs> I, to say that. I, I don't know exactly how much casting was done, you know, with, with that based on the, the limited bit of information I know about uh, Robert, Downey, Robert Downey Jr. But I have to admit, I absolutely adore Benedict Cumberbatch, the Doctor, Doctor Strange. I think... Oh. I think he's amazing. It may have something to do with his facial hair, but regardless, <laughs> I love the way he portrays the character. I think he's, I think he's great. There was a moment um, in an Iron Man comic that you would love where Doctor Strange and Iron Man had to team up and Iron Man kept messing with him, trying to get him to high five because they were, and I quote, awesome facial hair bros. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. It was a good time. <laughs> So fantastic. <laughs> I love that. Um, so, um, again, one of the, um, another, another one of the ways that, so even um, in, in the, in the new way that, uh, that the Black Widow character has kind of been um, morphed a little bit to be, uh, to be a bit more um, interesting, relevant, you know, um, I, whatever the, whatever the proper term may be. Um, in the movies, much like Black Widow, like you said, she she won't attack unless unless provoked. Um, the but they also share the same symbol, that hourglass symbol, um, that basically works as a, a warning. Uh, in the Spider World, it works as a warning that their venom is stronger and that it could be used if needed. Um, Natasha apparently has the same symbol on her belt. Is is there is there a similar a similar reason that they have those those shared that they both have the or the character uses that same spider symbol or do you think it's just coincidence and just looks cool on the outfit since she wears all black and needs a speck of color? Well, you know she was named the Black Widow and when they went through that redesign in 1970 because her original costume was ridiculous, uh, they just incorporated the the hourglass symbol from the spider on to the new costume uh, to also tie in with Spider-Man because that's where she debuted that new look. Because ah. in the 70s, everything important happened in Spider-Man. It's no wonder Spider-Man was the... Uh, was Spider-Man in in recent recent history, was Spider-Man the first of all of the the superheroes in order to get movies and, and whatnot? There have been several Spider-Men. Mm -hmm. uh, no, in recent history... After Batman and Robin, the George Clooney one, almost killed superhero movies, it was actually Blade with Wesley Snipes mm -hmm. that showed superhero movies could be taken seriously. That led to the X-Men getting their series, which led to Sony stop, they stopped dragging their feet on Spider-Man, mm -hmm. and it just sort of blew up from there. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd totally forgotten about it. Yeah. So I everyone has Cousin Wesley to thank for the superhero boom of the 2000s. <laughs> I, I remember I remember when Blade came out, um, and I, I didn't I didn't understand the um, I didn't understand the motivation. I was just kind of like, okay, you know, because I I was not I was not a comic book person, so I didn't realize that it was a I didn't realize he was a you know a superhero kind of um, uh, character. Um, so um, again. Um, couple of comments about Black Widow. Um, Black Widow Venom works best on vertebrates, um, which seems appropriate. Again, well, I mean, to, just slight okay. correction there. Yes, it, John. It works on that. I wouldn't say it works best. I mean, Black Widows, okay. they use their venom primarily to subdue their prey. And it also happens to work on vertebrates. But I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily wouldn't. designed specifically to work on vertebrates. It just happens in addition to killing all the other things and other arthropods, um, it has these properties. Thank, thank. I appreciate the correction. Thank, because I thought it works best on vertebrates, and yet they don't attack unless they're provoked. So, how in the you know what's the what's the connection there? But no, thank, thank, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, there are. I don't know about in spiders. I know in 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 venomous reptiles, there are some that that feed a lot on small rodents and they actually do have venoms that uh, are more problematic for us because they really have been designed for mammals. Um, so they, there's, I, I think a lot of vertebrates, I mean, venom's an expensive thing. And generally if you're, you know, for every vertebrate that a black widow eats, it probably eats several orders of magnitude more invertebrates. So it's kind of like, you know, having this extra baggage around evolution doesn't like that. It basically, 
if you're spending a lot of calories to keep something around, you better be using it. Otherwise, you're going to be selected again. So, uh, and John, when you say expensive, you mean that, right? Like that it, the amount of calories, the amount of energy it yeah, takes. Yeah, I mean, everything, to, everything yeah. animals, their behaviors, uh, carrying around like extra body parts, even armor. You know, there are cases where, you know, things that are armored, sometimes if they get, if their predators disappear, they stop producing the armor or the venom and things like that. So there are lots of cases, real cases in biology where um, it's just like, there's always an arm race. There's things that are trying to eat you. You're trying to eat other things. Um, you have so many calories that you can put into your offspring, growing uh, and your defenses. And there's all kinds of trade-offs. So that's that's the way biology works. So uh, I, I would almost guarantee that for, well, black widow venom definitely has this effect on vertebrates. I it's quite unlikely it's evolved specifically for vertebrates. I think the encounters are incredibly rare, uh, but it does happen. And these changes, um, you know, if, a, if an insect or um, any any creature is going to be like you said, there's a they they carry an armor due to a predator. That predator goes away or is removed from the system in which they both live for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. That that armor doesn't just fall off. Like it takes. It takes, yeah. it could yeah. take quite a it's bit just, of time for that. It's change. gradual. I mean, you can appear, I mean, a good example would be flightless birds, you know, places where flightless birds, it happens repeatedly on islands where there are no predators. So the dodo, that's why the dodo, when it, it was a large pigeon that was so large it couldn't fly, but it really didn't matter because there, until men arrived on the islands, um, there were no predators for them. So they, but as soon as you reach that predator, they can't evolve back to that. So it happens repeatedly with things. Um, um, so there's lots of classic examples of cases where, but it really does. If you talk to a biologist, um, there's a cost to everything. And uh, it, it's, it's used by other animals. I mean, I don't know about signaling, but um, in birds, for example, color, um, females choose based on how colorful a male is. It's, it's actually a, an indicator of their fitness, their overall health. If, if you're sick, you have a lot of parasites, you're not able to basically look your best. So it isn't any different in humans. I mean, we try to look our best and that's a signal to a potential mate that, hey, you know, I'm in good, I'm, I'm, I'd be a good uh, parent, um, healthy. Um, it, it, it's true throughout the plant and animal kingdom. Well, we actually, uh, we have a question. Uh, we actually have a question that has, uh, that has come in uh, pretty recently. So uh, Dan, uh, Dan Sullivan asked, what is the most dangerous superhero <laughs> animal that we have around the Tuscaloosa area? Uh, look in the mirror. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we say that a lot in our fossil talk too, John. We always say it's yeah. this one. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it really I is. You, yeah, well, well not being venomous. I mean, he did, he did qualify. <laughs> we just said most dangerous, I would say, humans. Uh, <laughs> but most venomous um, would likely be um, one of our native uh, vipers. Uh, probably, I would probably go with the um, timber rattlesnake, or if you're, if you're further down Alabama, you will also get into diamondback rattlesnakes, which get bigger. So I would probably say um, a big diamondback rattlesnake would probably be uh, pound per pound, the most venomous, whether it's, you know, and again, venomous doesn't necessarily mean dangerous. I think we tend to equate that. It's like, if you have really powerful venom, you're necessarily very dangerous. I mean, Potentially, but not necessarily. I think a lot of these animals that have venom, um, much like the black widow, they only use it as a last resort. They have other mechanisms. Their first mechanism is always just to turn tail and hide. And they will do that. But if you corner them, if you pick them up and you restrain them, then they'll they'll actually start using some of their other defenses, including the ability to you know inject venom into a potential predator. That's, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, John. I'm trying to process. I'm processing <laughs> right, right on the spot. It's live, everybody. Things, things happen. Um, so to kind of riff off of um, off of Dan's question, um, that actually puts um, it's a beautiful segue actually into um, the stings and biting things segment. Um, speaking of biting things. Um, so it's interesting to hear what people are actually experiencing whenever they are bit by an insect. So 
would you say that people use the term bite pretty universally and they say bite when in fact the insect is either pinching or stinging? Like why, mm. why do we, I think, you know, again, this, just universally. I, I think people use it, non-scientists and, and your average person in the street probably use it interchangeably. And, and some people don't know. I mean, all you know is you see a bug or an, some kind of arthropod, you experience a pain. Um, you may not be thinking, hey, oh, this is a spider. That means it's biting me with the fangs of its chelicera. You're not, you're not thinking about that. You just have a quake. Maybe you've been stung. You can get stung by plants. I mean, there are stinging nettles, for example. Um, so you can get stung by things. So I think sting is something a little more common. Um, and inanimate objects can sting you. Um, biting is a little bit more of an... Um, that's where I'm looking for kind of you, you equate that more with animals, dogs, you know, being bit by a, a child, you know. So I think we think about that the other way. And also, you know, if you're which end you're looking at. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of people say, Oh, I was bitten by a fire ant. And I have to remind them, well, they do bite you, but that's not what you're feeling and that's not what's causing you pain. They they bite you to hold on and then they use the back end of themselves to put their stinger in you. And that's what you're actually feeling. That's what's going to produce that little pustule. So a lot of animals, truth be told, bite and sting. A lot of the wasps do the same thing. Uh, bees, um, we just, the sting, it's kind of like completely swamps out any pain you would experience from their bite. And th their bite is just a mechanical bite. There's no venom or anything. So it's a pinch and it's kind of like, you just don't feel it. There's something more, a more powerful stimulus that's happening almost simulta uh, simultaneously. Except mosquitoes, right? Except mosquitoes. So, like I said, there are things. I like the the contrast I made between mosquitoes um, and ticks, and then other things like you know, um, tabanid horseflies. You know, if you've ever you know, been the alley. Allie, for some reason, is really attractive to horseflies and deer flies. She is a magnet. I am a delicious experience. individual, apparently. And I, no matter I've been, what I do, I've been bitten by some big horseflies and. Um, believe me, you feel. It. I mean, it's it, it's it's like the different gauge needles. So a mosquito is like an ultra fine needle. So I think most people don't feel the mosquito when it bites them. It's later on your body's response to the bite. When a horsefly or deer fly bites you, you feel it immediately. Um, it's just someone sticking a thumbtack in you. That's what it kind of feels like. And you know, it's you're, worst. you know, that's why I said I often when I when there are a lot of deer flies, as soon as I feel them on me, I'll, I'll try to kill them. Because I know they think a little, they're a little bit slower, so they land and then they kind of get positioned. Uh, so you've got a small window when you can get them off you, or mm -hmm. if you're quick enough to kill them, um, and then you're safe. But if you wait and they drop that big old drill in you, it, they're not going to do it without you knowing. I think is what I'm telling. Allie, you can you can speak from first hand experience. Um, it is not. Yeah, pleasant. I still have scars from some of the yellow flies from down at the beach. Yes, the yellow flies um, are, are like deer flies. They're deer flies. Same family. And yeah. get, we get some big ones here. I've seen some. There's a large black um, horsefly we get here, which I'm not joking, is about, let's see here, not that big. And they're just solid black. They've got massive eyes. Um, one neat thing about uh, tabanid flies is you can tell, you can sex them. If you get a look, the male's eyes are so big, they, they touch in the middle, uh, whereas the females are separated. So it's one of these cases where the sexual dimorphism is really apparent. Um, and you'll sometimes see, I, I can just look at a photo of someone posting one on iNaturalist and I can immediately tell you, I wouldn't know what the species was, but I could tell you what, whether it was a boy or a girl That's by looking at it. <laughs> I, um, at Expedition, we find horseflies are, are a, a common occurrence for us at Expedition. And um, yes, yes, Dan, we could, we're <laughs> gonna be best friends, I agree completely. Um, but yeah, at, at, at Expedition, they are common. Um, and there was, there was one, one expedition that we found that was about as big as what John was showing. And he ended up uh, surviving for like a week and then, or a couple days. And then he didn't survive any longer. We got him and we named him Tex because he was huge. <laughs> we thought it was an appropriate <laughs> name for a large firefly or for a large horsefly. But um, they do. I just, I always call them chunk biters because it feels like they just take giant chunks out of you. But I know it's not that, but still. Yeah. I have a related story about horseflies or, or the same family. So um, prior to coming to Alabama, I used to do a bunch of field work in Africa. And I mentioned my talk, you know, in the same family are tsetse flies. So if you ever hear of tsetse flies, they're just uh, a species in Africa and they're really common wherever there's big game. And uh, 
I was in a place once where they were so common, they would drive us nuts, they would land on us, and we were trying to shoot them off each other with um, rubber bands. But the one thing I observed that I'd never seen before is they, if you give them the opportunity, they will so engorge themselves with blood, they can't fly away. They have to kind of crawl away. So if any fly that gets into you, it just sucks up, I don't know how many milliliters of blood. Just it, it's, You can see it's full of blood. And it just is physically, it can know its wings aren't big enough for it to fly away. It has to kind of hope you don't see it while it kind of slinks away to kind of like, I'm gonna sleep this off. I feel the same when Rocky Road ice cream is anywhere near me. <laughs> <laughs> and or cheesecake <laughs> and or cake. <laughs> <laughs> and or goldfish crackers. I can also feel like it encourages teeth. Your goldfish, your goldfish crackers. Um, yeah. I was so, kind of curious, um, Catherine. Have, have you had the chigger experience? Because that's the other of all the things I mentioned. Those annoy me the most. No, like I, one of the, the, the ones you, you I, I know I don't. I know I. I know I look like the outdoors woman, but um, I try not to spend as as any more time outdoors than I absolutely yeah. have to, mainly because um, my my main nemesis is mosquitoes. Like I, I'm much like Ali. I am a delicious morsel, and they will they will fly they fly for the Red Cross around me, and um, they I just I just can't I just can't seem to shake them. And I've actually gotten to the point um, over the course of my lifetime that um, I can. Depending on where they land, I can actually feel when one has when one is is try, is starting to bite me, and um, but when they when when they're being a little bit sneaky and I don't feel it right off the bat because of course I nix them when I see them trying to trying to enjoy dinner, um, I um, I actually will not itch until about twenty four hours later. I've, I think I've I think I've had an overexposure to mosquitoes and I. You know, I don't get the you know I don't get the welts like immediately after a mosquito bite. I will not itch until about 24 hours after after the bite's taken place because I'll get bit in the evening, and then the very next evening I start itching and I thought what in the world? And then I go oh yeah that's right I was outside last night that must have been where I got a mosquito bite. So um, yeah, so unfortunately my main nemesis is uh, is mosquitoes, but um, on the pain index um, that's actually pretty darn low um, compared to what you and uh, you and Allie have, have experienced in your line of work. So, um, but um, speaking of the pain index, I just want to know um, how did, how was that put together? And do you know anything about the process of putting that pain index together? Yeah, I, I, I think there's actually a book on the subject. The, the author, uh, Justin Schmidt, is actually, there's a book I, when I was looking, doing a little bit of research, I saw you can buy on Amazon that talks about, and I think he, I don't know if he's personally, but I know he's, he's experimented on himself a lot. And he's also interviewed other entomologists and people that um, have documented cases of these different um, uh, sting. In this case, he only did, did it for Hymenoptera. So these were all be stings. And again, it's in, probably a combination of the, probably mostly due to the, the potency of the venom and also, um, you know, how big the stinger is. Uh, I mentioned, you know, there are really tiny wasps that if they stung you, you would never feel it because it's just, you know, it, it's so tiny. Um, and then there's other things like those giant uh, Asian hornets, they're relatively big. So I imagine proportionally their stinger uh, is much larger. So it's just a, like a bigger needle going into you plus more venom. Um, but it's a really interesting scale. Um, like I said, there are people there, there, if you go on YouTube, there's actually people that make videos about um, some things that are on the far scale, like the, you know, things like tarantula killers or tarantula hunters, or these large um, wasps that live out in um, the southwest that hunt tarantulas. Uh, kind of our little analog, you can see them here, are cicada killers. They're one of the larger wasps we have here, and they, that's exactly what they do. They they hunt cicadas, and I have seen them in my front yard. You see a cicada flying, and you realize, oh, it's not the cicada; it's the cicada being carried by a large wasp. Uh, that, that is one of the coolest things it. to see. Yeah. Um, it, it basically lays eggs on it and buries it. And it's basically a meal for a jump. And so they are impressive. When you see, if you see one, people are terrified of them. But again, as long as you're not cicada, you've got nothing to worry about, or unless you try to pick one up while it's alive. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to see something like, you know, things on the right-hand side. I have been in places where I've been seeing the bullet ants. Unfortunately, uh, 
never was stung by one, but again, their name because it they're named a bullet head because it feels like it got shot. You know, I think that's what I've read about them. So um, there are some really painful ones out there. Um, and again, you know, it doesn't have to be super painful either. I mean, I, Ali, again, getting back to our own experiences uh, with anaphylactic shock, uh, people that have sensitivities to it, um, being lost them, things that which would, would be minor things for you and me, once you become sensitized and have an immune system react, it's it suddenly, it's no longer an annoyance, it, it's a life and death situation. And when you read about people that die from uh, insect stings, it's almost always people that have um, anaphylactic shock due to a bee or wasp sting. And they either weren't diagnosed or they didn't have their EpiPen with them. And, you know, Ali and I have been to kind of this woofering, this kind of wildlife first aid because we do things in remote areas. And uh, it's just fascinating. I mean, that EpiPen only buys you time. You know, you basically get about 10 minutes. It, it basically hopes it keeps your airway open till EMTs can get there and, and intubate you. So they can, because what happens is um, you're, throat closes up and you can't, so it, it's a terrible thing to basically suffocate from the bee sting, uh, not from the venom uh, directly. So it, it's, if all the things I learned about that is this, and we, you know, it's a, it's a really common allergy. We regularly have um, participants in our, some of our summer programs who um, have EpiPens and we have to, you know, watch out for them, be prepared, like where it is and remind them, hey kid, you know, these are kids. Where's your EpiPen? Is in your backpack? Oh no, I don't need it. It's like go get it. You're, you're not taking any chances. And it, it's uh, we can't afford to have someone on our watch, uh, you know, suffer from this. So it, it's one of these things that a couple. Of, I don't know it was last year. Was it last year? It might have been two years by now. Time flies so quickly. But there was all this controversy about the price of EpiPens. Uh, I won't go into the story, but the price of them skyrocketed, and people stopped carrying them, or they couldn't get them, and you know, it was a really serious health crisis. Um, so hopefully, I think they're they're now generic alternatives. But uh, it's the one case where you know orthopods can be deadly, uh, even in Alabama. We have actually uh, another another specific question from uh, from Dan. He um, he asked he asked what is a chigger? I've always thought I got them when I dig in the dirt. John, is that accurate? No. Yeah. No, you're not getting from the dirt. Um, what I, what most people call it, again, sometimes people call things, you know, common names are like that. There may not be, a, what I typically think of chigger, if you Google chiggers, you'll find out um, they typically refer to a larval form of a particular kind of mite. Um, so they're these little mites that just do little, little stages of life cycle, only one of them did actually feed on a host. And it's one of the early uh, stages of them. And the way you get them is much like ticks, very similar. They kind of hang out in tall vegetation, grasses, things like that, and are waiting for, in most cases, the mammal or bird to come by to just come in contact with them, and they're waiting the tips of it. They crawl on you, and they crawl up. And the reason you tend to get them, just like ticks around your waist or places you have constrictions in your clothing, is they just crawl up, and then they find a place where they can't go any further, and then it's like, okay, I guess this is as far as I'm going. I'm going to settle here and feed. And that's when they feed on you. And for whatever reason, chiggers, um, they're almost microscopic. I've never actually seen one crawling on me, but I'll get the welts. And that's what most people find. First thing you know is what's itching. And they can just, I've had cases where I remember one summer in North Carolina, I, I got a bad case of it and I was just in misery for a week. My entire belt line, 360 degrees, right where um, your underwear would come in, tied, a belt, pants. Um, that was just this this entire band of irritated, itchy welts. And you know, just trying to get comfortable sitting. Allie's like nodding, like, I have so been there. <laughs> Justin, uh, have you ever had chiggers? I was about to say, Justin, any any superheroes that have a have a annoying <laughs> um, yet very uh, very potent? There, there's the tick. I don't think his, his, his bite is the annoying part. Is that correct there? No, the yeah, tick the, is great. There's nothing annoying about the tick. The tick is fantastic. <laughs> the tick is fantastic. I just found, Justin, I was going to tell you later, but I just found two of my tick comics the other day, and I got oh, really excited I, about them. I, I don't nice. know the I have a figurine, too. Does he have an interesting backstory? <laughs> Not really. He was a joke character. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. But he's fantastic. Terrible. <laughs> but, yeah. 
But as for personal experience, yeah, no, chickens? I'm a pasty, I'm a pasty white comic book nerd. I don't go outside <laughs> the months of March and October. Fair enough. I, I burn enough. under fluorescent lights. I get sunburned. So, uh, <laughs> A ball Fair of enough. fire in the sky. I don't know if you noticed. I try to stay away from it. <laughs> well, maybe maybe all these stories will make you want to go outside and potentially get triggered. No, I'm just kidding. The opposite effect. Completely yeah. opposite. <laughs> He's like, I'm never leaving my, my house again. <laughs> Allie, I'm, I've got a question for Allie. Um, you know, because we do so much stuff outdoors and Allie's so involved in expedition, I'm curious whether there's ever like a competition among like the middle school and high school participants like showing off their awesome cool it's like it's like, kind of like scars it's like look what i got today check out this tick i got or oh i got stung by this or does I that ever happen in camp it hasn't happened because no one would win against me i'm saying <laughs> um no but it hasn't happened but I, I i won't say that there's a competition but i will say that it is a hundred percent a one of the so we always talk about like so expedition, when you come to expedition, you come from Monday afternoon to Saturday morning and we, and you know, you're just placed into quite literally the middle of nowhere with a bunch of strangers that to like live in a tent for a while. And so you're and getting to know each other. What? Archaeology. Right. To do archaeology or paleontology or whichever one we're doing. And so, you know, Monday and Tuesday, you're kind of get to know people. But by Wednesday, you start comparing how hot it is and you start comparing like how I'm having to use a porta potty outside in the middle of Alabama in June. And then the big one is what kind of bites did you get? You know, like, like what did you and then they kind of show them off, not as badges of honor, but more as like a, a way to find some community <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> But nobody could now beat Allie my my camp yeah. legs, which is what I call the bruises and bites and that I have. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Allie, I, I, you also I know you're like the camp mom, so you're going around putting on like a calamine lotion and oh yeah, for sure. and we get to know. Uh, yes, yes, and we've had um, <laughs> the the uh, trigger experiences have been. We have had several trigger experiences, uh, and they are the most difficult, I think, which they, I mean, are for everyone, but they're the most difficult ones for campers to, to deal with, you know, because it's yeah. just hot and itchy and yeah. you just, like you said, can't get comfortable. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, absolutely. We have a whole section of our, our first aid area that is dedicated to just itch things <laughs> and just bite things. <laughs> Justin, are there any, uh, are there any comic book, um, comic book villains that, that, you that um you know have um an insect or you know any any kind of animal kind of um uh connection and they they use the venom use you know use the the same fighting tactic as their um is, is uh, particularly the um what are the what are the most well-known villains that do that and then some of the lesser known villains because i know i know you know both i know you know the answer to both of those questions Oh sure. The uh, most of Spider-Man's Rogues Gallery is based on animals, arachnids, insects, and uh, most of them are very similar in at least the mechanical aspects. If not, you know, the venoms. So scorpion, for example, is based off of the tsetse fly. No, I'm kidding. It's a scorpion. It's a scorpion. <laughs> it's a giant mechanical tail that stabs you, and he shoots venom. That it's I want to see Black Panther counts. fight the TT fly. I think that's an opportunity there. Give it how the Black Panther <laughs> franchises take it off. I think there's. We could maybe kickstart a new, you know, villain TT fly. I think somebody sure. contact Hollywood right now. <laughs> like I said, Kevin Feige is watching, looking for new ideas. Uh, but no, pretty much like there, there. Spider Man has one villain called the Gibbon. Which is just, he's just a giant gibbon. He's a guy that turned into a giant gibbon. Oh. And he's hairy and All orange, right. and, and no one's ever taken him seriously. <laughs> Poor oh, gibbon. Ever. Well, Aquaman had the same problem until quite recently. So, you know, there's. Okay. Uh, hey, excuse me, madam. I'll have you know <laughs> that Aquaman, outside of the Super Friends cartoon, has always been really, really serious. It was the Super Friends cartoon that made him stupid. Well, in the comics, about the time everyone thought, oh, he's so dumb, he'd lost a hand and replaced it with a hook and had long hair and a beard and was just a jerk. He's super I love cool. Love Aquaman. He's, he's <laughs> my, my, uh, one of my brother's favorites is Aquaman. He's just wonderful. 
Well, again, I I, I know I know very little. I know very little about um, <laughs> any of the the superhero characters. But whenever I think Aquaman, I do unfortunately think of kind of the. I guess it's the nineteen sixties. Yeah, um, Super Friends. Yeah, yeah. Where he's water skiing on the back of two uh, seahorses. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that one show is responsible for Aquaman being a joke for fifty years. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> if that if they weren't intending to do that, well, they knocked it out of the park regardless. Because bless bless poor Aquaman, he just. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, we have one more question for Dan uh, from Dan um, that is. Uh, let's see. He says, "What's the best way to keep mosquitoes off of us this time of year?" Staying inside. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't argue with that. that actually is the truth. But if you had to go outside, um, there are um, several commercially available repellents. Um, D, there's um, some other ones um, that I use. As Picardin is another one. I don't like D. Um, it's very effective, but I, it tends to uh, destroy some plastics. And, you know, so many things I deal with, cameras and things like that, that um, if you want to see – Take a styrofoam cooler and pour some deed on it, or I've, I've ruined many pairs of glasses. You know, you get deed on your hands. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've gone to some of the uh, alternatives that seem to work for me as effectively. So that is probably the easiest thing to do. Um, you can treat your clothing with permethrin. Um, a lot of these these um, insect repellents work not only against mosquitoes but also ticks and chiggers. So um, when I'm, you know, all the, usually what I do with the first when it starts getting warm, I usually take a set of one or two sets of clothes and spray them with uh, commercially available permethrin spray. Um, so they're like a second level of the clothes themselves and they it lasts for several washings before it comes out. Um, you also use DEET, um, but even still, you can still get bitten. Um, the other best thing is to kind of reduce for mosquitoes, you can reduce them by reducing the habitats in which they reproduce. I mentioned in my talk, uh, mosquitoes require standing water to reproduce, but not very much of it. Um, they don't necessarily need big pools. Um, there's enough water in, um, you know, um, I was saying it's a lot of um, gutters that collect leaves. A little bit amount of water that collects there is sometimes enough for them to complete their life cycle. So removing any standing water is by far uh, the best way to reduce the local abundance of them. And then the other thing I recommended was you can buy these granules or tablets that are contain a special type of bacteria that only kills mosquito larvae. They're harmless to other forms of aquatic life. And you can add those. So if you have a water feature in your backyard, you can put those in there without killing your fish or the frogs or the turtles or anything, but just affect that. Um, so those are my general recommendations. Um, I'm not a big fan. Uh, where I live in Tuscaloosa, the city sprays. And I hate the sound of that truck at night coming through there because it kills the mosquitoes, but it also kills a lot of other insects that are beneficial. So there isn't the... the Aerosol sprays they use are not uh, species specific. They will kill all kinds of insects. Whereas those other mechanisms I mentioned uh, are much more specific for mosquitoes. And um, plant rosemary, have, yeah, yes, yeah, we see that there. Great suggestion I, from um, Elizabeth to plant rosemary yeah. around your yard as well. Same way, citronella is another citronella, plant you can plant that yeah. has some um, geraniums where permethrin comes from. Um, so there's, a, I think, like a multifold. Uh, people buy bug zappers. Again, they. Well, they can kill mosquitoes. They actually attract and kill many other insects besides mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So um, I generally find reducing breeding sites for them uh, local, around your house. And then when you do have to go outside, um, they're most active kind of at dusk. So that's the real period I find when I have to put on bug spray. Uh, most of the times of the day, I don't need it. Um, and then it also varies some people. Um, you can have two people... Um, <coughs> And some people are just magnets for insects. Um, it's not really clear. I mean, they're attracted to the the carbon dioxide we put out, the warmth of our body. But um, they are people have died. There are some people which are just tastier to bugs, and I don't know what to tell people those people. Named Allie and, and people yeah. named Catherine. <laughs> yep. Um, we actually have a we have a question from Jennifer uh, Sullivan. She said, "I've read that keeping a small pool or a cup of water with those mosquito dunks is a good idea to control the population. Is that a good idea, John? Is that a good idea?" Yeah, I mean, it, it's only going to work with where the where the dunks are in the water. So, um, the way it works is the bacteria that um, is in those 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 tablets 
it has to come in contact with live mosquito larvae. So it would require mosquitoes. So it's only, only mosquitoes that lay their eggs in that cup of water are going to be affected. It's not going to miraculously uh, get into other, other bodies of water that you might have close to it. Uh, so you have to physically add you know, these products to the water itself. And I think the tablets last several weeks. Um, you can order them online. I think local hardware stores like Home Depot and Lowe's have them as well. Um, and I've actually seen people, I saw someone recommend this. Actually, um, you can actually carry some with you. So in your neighborhood, if you know there's someone that has uh, standing water, you could sneak in, sprinkle a little bit <laughs> in there and kind of maybe know the, none the wiser. And they <laughs> would realize, hey, where do the little mosquitoes go? And you could be the little mosquito killing fairy in your neighborhood. <laughs> Oh, surreptitious mosquito killing! I love it. Um, well, we are uh, we are nearing uh, we are nearing almost an hour. It's been great to have so many comments uh, comments and and questions coming in. So thank thank you to uh, to everybody that's done that. Um, Allie, do you wanna do you wanna have? Um, is there anything you wanna leave our audience with uh, this evening about stings uh, stings and biting things? as the name of the day. Yeah, I think um, you know just to maybe look at these. Uh, stings and biting things in a different light now, maybe because we have some different information out there. Um, and if you still don't want to get up close and personal with them, then you can make your buzzing craft and pretend like you're up close and personal with them. Excellent suggestion. Excellent. I love that. Um, Justin, anything, uh, anything from the comic book world uh, related to stings and biting things? Um, just remember, when you're reading comic books in your room, it's very unlikely you're going to get attacked by things that sting or bite. <laughs> so always stay inside. This is for all of your comic needs. <laughs> I feel like both of our... Conveniently located on Hargrove Road. <laughs> Justin, I think both of our final thoughts were in direct opposition of each other. <laughs> Mine's like, go outside. You're like, stay viewpoint. inside. Yeah. yeah, no, outside bad. Good. Everybody can just uh, take these suggestions at your own discretion. Um, uh, John, any, uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, again, I want to put a big plug in. Um, you know, today's theme touched on kind of what I think are you know, kind of negative uh, connotations and concepts about bugs in general. Again, I want to remind people it's the vast minority of insects and arthropods that are, are these kind of problems for us. Most of them are completely harmless. And then also there are many of these other um, arthropods are eating mosquitoes. I think about spiders and spider webs and dragonflies, uh, many of the other insects that you see around here. So in general, um, having kind of a healthy environment for insects, um, it actually reduces the kind of pest insects because the other good bugs are eating the bad bugs. Uh, it's in places where we don't have these other predators where they've been killed by pesticides. And then you get, you know, there are, you know, mosquitoes that have resistance to certain pesticides, you know? So that's why mosquitoes are such a big problem is because we, we keep looking for our solution is chemicals and, and kind of man-made chemicals to control them. And the reality is they, they keep evolving and, uh, probably a more long-term solution, which I would prefer is just letting nature take its course. Um, these mosquitoes have natural predators. Um, so that little jumping spider, you know, keep them around, encourage them. Don't spray bug spray where you've seen, you know, these spiders or spider webs. Maybe leave that spider web up because it's going to catch some mosquitoes. Um, so that's kind of my lesson is that, you know, um, yes, these things bug us, but they're things that eating them, you know, one of my favorite thing about ticks is, um, I see this statistic or I've heard it and I, I think there's some truth to it. I don't know about the numbers, but that opossums, they eat so many ticks. And then, you know, people think opossums are ugly. I don't want them in my yard. They're messing with my bird feeder, but um, they really serve a vital function. They actually eat these nasty ticks and they help keep them down. So again, reminding people that um, everything's interconnected and it's really hard to take out one thing. And a lot of our problems with some of these pests are because we've removed the natural predators um, that would help keep them in control. That yes, it's a that's a very good point. I again, I'm I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of bugs, but anytime I see anytime there's um, there's a spider that I feel that you know I might see you know crawling across my counter or something like that that I feel like I can safely catch and put outside as I as I'm putting that that 
spider outside, I say, okay, you live out here and I'll go eat, go eat a bunch of mosquitoes and stay out of my kitchen, you know, type thing. Yeah. Um, and, and I do, I talk, I talk to the spider as I, as I very gingerly, but emphatically chuck it out of my door and say, you belong out here, go eat the mosquitoes out here. Um, and um, so that's, uh, that, that's an excellent suggestion, John. And I hope everybody, um, I hope everybody remembers that, that, you know, the first, the first instinct should not be to, to, kill um when uh, when appropriate so um thank you uh thank you so much for um for all all the information and uh, i just have a couple of quick suggestions before we go um i want everybody to check out the uh, bama bug art contest um the last day that we are accepting submissions is friday july the 17th the submission form is uh, will close at five o'clock on that day so uh please 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 head over to BamaBugFest.org for all the information. There is a, a section further down that has the the link on and all the details and the directions on how to submit. So please, please get your artwork sent by Friday the seventeenth at five p.m. Um, that um, I think that's going to wrap it up for us today. I want to thank you again for joining us for Bama Bugfest on the web. Um, our special Q and A session. Make sure to check us out on Saturday, July 18th, for moths and butterflies, a day dedicated to programs about those familiar fluttering friends. Um, as always, content appears at 10, 2, and 4, with the daily wrap up at 7, and all times are Central Standard Time. If you aren't able to join in for the live presentations, you can always go back and watch them later as archived videos on our social media sites, YouTube channels and linked in our handy resource guide, which our musical friend uh, Lance has put together for us, and it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of our event partner social media sites and YouTube channels. As always, we want to thank UA Museums, the Warner Transportation Museum, the Alabama Museum of Natural History, the Department of Research and Collections at UA, UA's Rogers Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library for all of your work in organizing this event. And thank you so much to our guests, Dr. John Friel, Ali Sorley, and Justin Snipes for helping us out today. We appreciate you sharing a little of your time and expertise with us. And it's been a fantastic chat. I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you all so much. And uh, again, everybody tune in on um, Saturday, July 18th for Moths and Butterflies. And um, we, will, um, we will see you again on uh, Saturday evening at 7 o'clock for our wrap up. Thanks so much. Have a great evening.